Hi, friends. Welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. On this podcast, we introduce you to the women of Christ Chapel Bible Church. We love being encouraged to live out our faith in Jesus by hearing the stories of women in our church community. We are so glad that you're here. It doesn't take much time with Lauren Lucart to see how much she loves sharing the gospel. Whether as a child with a camp bracelet, a college student with a student government group, or an adult with refugee friends in Poland, Lauren's heart lights up. She can't help but step toward the broken and give them Jesus. We hope you will breathe in some of her passion and take it into your sphere. Here's Camille and Lauren's conversation. Hi, and welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. I'm Camille, and I'm so glad to have Lauren Lucard here today. And Lauren, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. What is a small thing that's brought you joy recently? Yeah, so I have the privilege of living with four amazing girls. And recently, on Friday night, uh, one of my roommates, Catherine Gaddy, um, looked at me about an hour before our favorite ice cream shop closed (gasps) closed and they're actually um all the way in south lake they have a couple locations in like dallas area too but it's my favorite ice cream place that i like grew up with and Mm -hmm. they just opened up like texas locations recently and so she was like do you want to go and we called our other friend riley humphrey (laughs) and like literally we didn't have time to just go pick her up so we had to meet at like a uh, middle ground location so oh that we would make it to the ice cream shop <laughs> on time. And we all got in the car and um, went, it's called Handles. Yes. Oh people have been telling me about this. It's amazing. Um, okay. Highly recommend the Graham Central Station flavor. Mm. Um, but that was just really fun and spontaneous. And we went to McDonald's afterwards and got mm. French fries. Mm. And it was just a great night of unplanned events. So that was a little thing that brought me joy. I love that. Yeah. Um, you were not the only person to tell me about handles. It's people, amazing. People are on fire yes. about handles. <laughs> this is not paid for. This podcast is not sponsored by <laughs> no, handles. Not sponsored by Was no. it Caroline Reyes that told you about it? I think so. Okay. I I took her the first uh, time. Oh, got it. So I'm like slowly infiltrating yeah. the Christ Chapel community with the love for yes. handles ice cream. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she pulled like made me pull up the menu like mm-hmm. as we were talking. Yep. And I was like, okay, like this Caroline. place is legit. Okay. <laughs> Worth a one-hour drive? Oh, absolutely. In Great. college especially, me and Catherine would go all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't we don't go as frequently now that we have full-time jobs. Yeah. But um, got responsibilities. Yeah. But it's great. So, That's so funny. Super good times. As I was driving here this morning, I noticed that the last person who was in my car, which is my husband, had failed to tell me that he got McDonald's like <laughs> late at night coming home from a football game mm. and he left the wrapper in the car. So oh. like – I think I smell like McDonald's right now. Mm. So you saying that made me think, mm, I think I need to get some ice cream to balance out. Yeah, exactly. That's smell. what you have to do after this. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lauren, I'm so glad you're here today. Um, if you don't know Lauren Listener, you really need to get to know her. She has a fantastic story. Um, she's doing a ton of things <laughs> like If you see her, she might be a blur because I feel like she's running from one thing to the next. Um, But we want to get to know you, Lauren. So tell me about where where you're from. Tell me about how you came to know the Lord. We want to know all about you. Yeah. So I originally grew up in North Dallas area, Allen, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents and my whole family really was really involved in the church. Um, We grew up grew up going to a Baptist church and um, got really involved there. But really early on in my childhood, um, religion kind of switched from like a family forced activity to something that we got to choose for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I got really plugged in with wildlife, which is the middle school version of young life. And some of my counselors there um, just really invested in my life and taught me about the love of Jesus in a way that um, allowed me to grapple with um, the really heavy burden I felt from even a young age of just the tragedy of the fact that so many people don't get to know Jesus. Mm. Um, And so it was at age nine at a wildlife camp that I fully surrendered my life to Christ. Um, Mm. And for the next few years, I got to live in really sweet community and felt really supported and 
um, got to share the gospel and um, live in a way that was really supported Mm -hmm. um, through mentors and counselors in my life. But then at age 12, uh, we moved from Allen, Texas to San Diego, California. Oh, that's a big move. Yes. Like not just distance, but like totally different community, I would imagine. Yes. Very different. My Both my parents are from Oklahoma. And mm-hmm. so all of our extended family like lived in Texas and Oklahoma. So moving out to California was like completely new to all of us. Yeah. And when we moved out there, I like tried to get involved in the church at first and tried to invite people in to that area of my life, but just faced um, a lot of persecution and just a lot of, Mm. I think, unfamiliarity with the church, with the kids that were my age. I wouldn't say that religion was cultural at all. Um, And so throughout the years while we lived in San Diego, I just really fell far from the Lord and honestly became really apathetic um, Mm -hmm. and just got caught up in things I could control because so much control had been taken from me and so um, fell into a lot of like perfectionism and trying to achieve my way through Mm -hmm. um, high school. Um, But then um, that plan of me, you know, working my way up to achieve this like dream college um, the Lord and His sovereignty like took that away from me, and I didn't really get into most of the colleges that I applied to. That is shocking. <laughs> like you're a very eloquent person, just having met you once. I That's can't very sweet. Imagine you not getting into the colleges that you had like strived toward. Yeah, I was definitely very distraught because um, mm-hmm. I think I had just wrapped up so much of my identity in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really the Lord's kindness that allowed me to go to TCU. Um, it wasn't even really on my radar until my cousin convinced me to apply and um, wasn't something I took seriously until it was really my only option. Mm-hmm. Um, but coming to TCU, I got connected to my big and my sorority, mm-hmm. um, and she was really the first person that um, showed me what it really looks like to um, have Jesus' love infect every area of your life, mm. but also challenged me and called me out on, okay, Lauren, you say that you're a Christian and you say that this is true of your life, but I don't really see that reflected. And she shared the Great Commission with me, Matthew mm-hmm. 28, 19 through 20. And she had no idea that, you know, the gospel was really the way that the Lord had wired me. And um, evangelism was such a key part of my story. And I think that was a really big turning point for me in my faith journey of I um, have been uniquely wired to love people in this way, but I had just lost sight of that and really put a lot of focus on myself. Mm -hmm. And so from that point on throughout college, um, just really got to walk with the Lord a lot more closely and fell back in love with um, sharing the gospel and discipleship. And um, the Lord, since then, has just put so many amazing people in my life to grow and mature me. And I'm so far from finished. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been just such a sweet thing to reflect back on of yeah. I didn't choose God um, over and over again, but he just continued to to pursue me mm-hmm. faithfully. So, Okay. You, you mentioned a minute ago that like God hardwired you with the gospel like Mm. that is your goal is to make the gospel known and i mean i've known you for like five seconds (laughs) in my life but like it's very clear to me that like that's the first thing that you wanted to talk about was the gospel Mm. but i want you to tell what it was like for you when you first came to christ because Mm. i don't think that i've ever heard this before that like a nine or ten year old little girl would like focus on sharing the gospel with her neighbors can you tell me about that yeah So as I mentioned earlier, um, I think that the way that God really drew me to himself was from the age of a little kid. I just saw how um, broken the world was, Mm -hmm. and I was just really overcome with grief from a young age over the reality that so many people weren't going to heaven. And so when I came to know the Lord, I wanted to do everything in my power to to share that with other people. And mm-hmm. so 
um, at the camp that I came to faith that they gave out these little bracelets with different colored beads. Oh, yeah. um, Mm -hmm. Like red for the blood of Jesus, black for sin, all these different things. And so I went home and like bought string and bought all these (laughs) colored beads Mm -hmm. and I made like hundreds of them. Oh, my goodness. And then I like used my like old school printer copier to like copy the one little card they gave us. Yeah. Um, And I like cut them out and went just door to door and um, passed them out and shared the gospel with people that way. And mm-hmm. it was really the only way I had been shown how, but mm-hmm. I was just so hungry to to show people um, that there was a solution mm-hmm. for their pain. Um, so, yeah. yeah, That's such a beautiful, like, gift that the Lord gave you mm-hmm. that at such a young age, He would design you in such a way that um, your heart would break for the sin in this world and that He met you so quickly with the hope of the gospel um, so that even as you didn't know you were being prepared to move across the country and experience brokenness in your own life um, and pain, but that he was there with you mm-hmm. and had the answer all along. I love that. Um, so you ended up back in Texas and we're all so grateful that you did. <laughs> um, you went to TCU and um, when you got here, um, did you and you said that your big was really influential in your life and like pointing out sin and really helping you to reconcile with the Lord? Um, tell me about how you decided to find a church. What was that like for you? Yeah, so common theme here. I really wanted after my freshman year of college, after like growing in the Lord and um really just feeling like I was more grounded in him, mm-hmm. kind of shift my foot shifted my focus from, okay, I need to, you know, mature in Christ myself, but then how can I invite others into this? And Mm -hmm. so I was looking for a church where I could invite anyone in that had never been to church in their life, never heard the name of God, and they would feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I naturally picked the church in the bar. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And so I chose the Aardvark, which used to be the name of the Christ Chapel College ministry Mm -hmm. back when um, it was in this little old retired bar um, right off of TCU's campus. I love that. Did you have like were you able to meet friends that you could invite and did they come? Like, what was the response of people when you're like, hey, come to the bar with me on Sunday for worship as the <laughs> Lord? Yeah, it was really um, funny because I think people that never would have considered going to church showed up. I love that. Um, and they felt like they could be themselves because also just the environment created this culture that was way more relaxed and welcoming. You know, people were sometimes showing up in their like big Greek sorority t-shirts. Like we weren't dressing to the nines and um, acting like we had it all together. There was like sometimes like cigarettes on the floor from the night before. Uh (laughs) Um, And so I think that that really created this culture of I don't have to pretend like I have all the answers to come here. Yeah. Um, And I think that that was a really sweet Um, season of my life where I had um, the ability to invite people to something that I knew was going to not feel overwhelming, Mm -hmm. but also a place where they were really going to proclaim the gospel clearly. So I love that. Yeah. Tell me what it was like for you as you were able to like grow in your faith while you were in college ministry, but also like I'm assuming you had influence like within your sorority and with some friends that you met. Like, how did you cultivate relationships in which you could disciple younger women or women who were younger in the faith even? Yeah. Um, It's kind of funny because I thought that my sorority would be my main form of ministry going in Mm -hmm. as well, just because that was so influential for my story with my big um, being such a big part of that. But where I actually found God provide the most favor was through the student government organization I was a part of Mm -hmm. called Frog Aids. Um, Essentially, the way it was structured was about 40 freshman students are in this cohort, which is a big fancy TCU word for group. Um, (laughs) But it does sound really fancy. (laughs) Like cohort makes me think, oh, they're really doing something. 
<laughs> Something important. Yeah. And essentially then from the year prior, there was an exec board of about eight students that are made up of sophomores or juniors that did the program their freshman year and then two directors. And I had the privilege of not only being in the organization my freshman year, but also getting to later be on exec and then be the director with one of my best friends. Oh, wow, that's so cool. Um, yeah, it was it was an awesome part of college. And um, I loved it because unlike traditional student government, we weren't really as focused on, you know, impacting the campus. It was really impacting those 40 freshman students. Mm. And so it was literally the perfect um, model yeah. for um, discipleship and mentorship. And so I got the privilege to walk alongside um, two girls the year that I was on exec, um, as well as coincidentally getting to share with um, my one of my best friends who was in the program with me as a freshman mm -hmm. and then served on exec with me and then was my co-director. Wow. Um, her name's Katrina, and now we actually uh, live together, which is <gasps> oh, absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, getting to walk with Katrina, but also Ella and Rachel, and then the next year when we were Katrina and I directed the program. I got to mentor these twins, uh, Olivia and Savannah, and this other girl named Anaya. And it was just like such an awesome experience getting to just be their friend and like mentor through this program. And then them get to just watch my life mm -hmm. of, okay, I'm like going to church on Sunday. Like, do you want to come? I'm going to like hang out with um, these people at my house. Like, you're always welcome. The door's always open. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that model of we weren't connected because of this Bible study or this, yeah. um, you know, church event, but really just got to see each other's lives um, mm -hmm. was really special. And God allowed um, there to be a lot of unique favor in mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. Yeah. How was it transitioning out of like your college years? Like, it seems like so ideal not idealistic like just so natural and organic the way that the lord used your life like your whole life mm -hmm. like not just your studying not just your classes not just your ministry your sorority like he incorporated so much of what you were doing in those i'm assuming four years yeah to like build you up and to like work through you in those relationships was it the same like when you graduated and started working in your job? It's definitely been a lot harder. Um, I think that at TCU, um, there was so much more opportunity to rub shoulders with people. Mm -hmm. um, like I was constantly in a student activity where I was getting to meet people. Um, and I think that now post-grad, you have to really fight for intentionality, mm -hmm. um, especially with your coworkers. So I have the privilege of getting to work with people from like all over the DFW Metroplex. Like a lot of my coworkers live in Dallas or yeah. Grapevine or different places. And so it takes a lot more intentionality to get dinner with them or yeah. hang out or even just have, um, you know, meaningful conversations at work. But God has really blessed me and I have like the most incredible coworkers ever. And um, I have gotten the opportunity to just share like my life and my walk with them. And um, I would say that everyone is like very respectful and very curious. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been cool to just, you know, I don't want any of them to ever feel like I can't be their friend if they don't believe what I believe. Right. Um, but they've gotten to see that my faith um, actually leads to action. And I think a lot of them have come in contact with people throughout their years where they claim to be a believer and walk with Christ, but then their life doesn't really reflect that. And so yeah. it's been cool to navigate conversations with them on what they believe and mm -hmm. um, where they're at in that journey. So, yeah. yeah. I think having somebody who's willing to like ask the questions, like mm. not even like difficult questions, but just questions that would be like, would reveal a sense of vulnerability between the two of you. Like, what is it that you actually believe? And mm -hmm. not in a judgmental way, but just ready to listen and then offer the opportunity to be authentic with them as well. Probably is a little startling. Yes. And I think um, 
there's just been a lot going on personally in my life this past year where I've like kind of laid out my vulnerability cards on the table and my coworkers mm-hmm. have seen me cry so many times. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think that that has just uh, kind of broken down like these normal walls of like, oh, we're supposed to like keep our personal lives separate. Yeah. Um, which has been really cool. And like, it's been honestly one of my greatest joys this year, just getting to know them and getting to pray for them and mm-hmm. walk alongside them and like whatever they're going through. I so. You're also in a unique position. I don't, listener, if you don't know Lauren, she, well, you can tell us, tell us about what you do so that I can frame the next set of questions around that because it's important. (laughs) Yes. So I am a graphic designer at American Airlines and it's such a fun job, very Mm -hmm. creative. So, yeah. Um, So working at American Airlines, you obviously have a lot of wonderful things that come along with your job, not just your work and not just your colleagues, but the fact that you you're working partially in the office and partially at home. So you have a bit of a flexible schedule. Yes. And you have travel benefits, which is wonderful. Amazing. <laughs> which leads me to my next question, yes. which is you have visited some very interesting places multiple times recently. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. So kind of a crazy um, set of events that led up to that. I – randomly um, got invited to go to one of the global missions lunches through one of my now best friends, Maggie Campis. And upon attending that missions lunch, ran into Danella, Mm -hmm. um, who works for Christ Chapel. And she had invited me to go on a mission trip to Poland, Mm -hmm. um, where they would be serving the Ukrainian refugees that had been displaced there. And it was kind of a last minute um, request. Essentially, someone could no longer attend, and Danella knew I had flight benefits and could potentially um, go um, late, late notice. And mm-hmm. so I had just started my job at that point. That was November of last year. I started in June. Mm-hmm. And so I was very, um, you know, hesitant to even ask my boss for yeah. a time off or assume that she would grant that. But the Lord just really um, paved the way for everyone to say yes. I love that. And um, allow me to take PTO in advance and all these different things. And so I got to go and just meet so many of the Ukrainians in Warsaw um, and other t- smaller towns that we visited outside of um, the capital and just got to be overwhelmed by um, the need for the gospel and how receptive the Ukrainians' hearts were because they had been stripped of everything, but also just their love for one another and, like, the tragedy and, like, the scale of what they were going through. Um, I just – it was very, very clear to me that God had given me these, you know, flight benefits and opportunities and that I was supposed to to do something about it, so – yeah. And you yeah. did. Yeah. And you went. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful that you did too. Um, while you were there, what were some of the ways that you saw the Lord like arranging things in such a way that um, people were able to see hope? Hmm. Was that part of your first trip or was that like on a subsequent trip where you were really able to see the gospel working and people clinging to that hope? Yeah. I think that every single trip has had different people at the focal point. Mm-hmm. Um, so on my first trip, there were two sisters that were refugees themselves that worked for Katie that God just gave me a lot of unique favor with and I got to share the gospel with. Mm-hmm. And it was such a cool experience getting to talk to people that grew up completely differently than I did. They grew up like in the Eastern Orthodox Church and had never really heard of a personal relationship with God. And Mm -hmm. the way that I talked about Jesus was just such a foreign concept to them. I told, I remember telling Lena that um, she could have a relationship with God like she does with her sister. Mm. Um, And that just really perplexed her. Um, But then in subsequent trips from there, I've gotten to had 
um, such a variety of conversations from meeting with some people like the director of the refugee center who his name's just off. He's very like philosophical and <laughs> our um, theological debates, as he calls them, <laughs> are much more uh, reason oriented mm-hmm. than emotion based. Um, he just has a lot of questions and yeah. a lot of thoughts. Um, and he's lived a lot more life than a lot of the even little kids that I've gotten to share with. Mm-hmm. And so there's conversations like that, but then there's conversations with nine year old orphans yeah. um that are looking for love mm. and um are so mesmerized by this idea that there is a king that has chosen them um so it's it's been a whirlwind of experiences and conversations but um every single one has been like so incredible yeah so how did you know you were going to go back like On your first trip there, Mm -hmm. this was like a last minute thing. You probably had not been praying for months and months and months about going to Poland and Mm -hmm. Ukraine. So like, how did you know that you were going to go back? Yeah, I remember being there and Marina and Lena specifically saying like, you've never been to Poland before or like, how many times have you been to Europe? And Um, At that point, I had just been one time before for like five days Mm -hmm. because I just started American and went on a spontaneous trip. And so I, you know, really had no cultural context. I also like wasn't really following the war closely um, up until going. And they were just um, in such awe that um, I felt so comfortable. And that was only from the Lord. Um, I think that God really just softened my heart to the people there. Mm -hmm. And I knew um, on my first trip that there were just a lot of conversations that were left unfinished. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, I'm really passionate about like developing relationships with people Mm -hmm. and sharing the gospel for me is not about, you know, like checking things off a, a, like a tally marker. Um, I like really deeply care for the people yeah. um, that I have gotten to meet there. And so I wanted to like follow up and be that person that they could count on coming back. Yeah. Um, and I think that we underestimate how much um, favor is given to us just by showing up, mm. you know, like God can do the rest. All you have to do is um, say yes. Mm-hmm. And so I think especially all the way over in Poland, um, it means a great deal to them, especially this far into the war, for people to still be coming um, and still care. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask you about your relationships there? Like, Mm -hmm. can you tell tell us about, like, who's there that you still get to communicate with regularly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the youngest refugee that I'm definitely the closest to um, is a little girl named Roslana. Um, She lives in the refugee center in Warsaw um, with her mom and one of her sisters. And I got to meet her actually the last day of my first trip. Um, And since then, have gotten to see her um, every time. Mm. And on my third trip, I got to share the gospel with her uh, more tangibly. Like mm-hmm. I had told her that God loves her and, um, you know, told her why I was there. Yeah. But I actually, it was a really cool, like full circle moment. We went in March with Christ Chapel and Danella and the rest of the team um, had put together the same bracelets that I originally passed out as a kid um, oh my goodness. with the cards in Ukrainian. Wow. Um, and so I got to use that to share the gospel with Roslana. And um, it was just a really special moment. I remember um, like when I gave her the card and she was reading it because it was in her language. Um, she like pointed to the part that like Jesus died for her and w- like her jaw dropped. And she was just like so in shock. Um And I don't know, like with the language barrier, like, and obviously, honestly, even without a language barrier, we can't fully know the hearts of people. So I don't know fully, like, 
if Roslana has conceptualized the gospel in its entirety, but I'm like so confident that um, the Lord is pursuing her yeah. and um, that he's not finished yet. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just getting to walk with her has been really sweet. And then I mentioned it a little earlier, but on like the opposite side of the coin with Chistoff, yeah. um, he's, it's so funny because I would have never thought that like this 40 year old Polish man would be like one of my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have really just enjoyed getting to know him. And um, last time I was in town in July, we got breakfast and um, I prayed over our meal and just said that I was grateful to God for our friendship. Mm -hmm. And after I prayed, he was like, I'm just so moved that you said that mm -hmm. um, because I really do um, view you as a friend. And yeah. it's just crazy to me that I could have um, that deep of a relationship with someone that lives so far away and yeah. on the surface, we have nothing in common. Right. Um, but God has really just softened um, both of our hearts to like have a heart for um, getting to discuss God together. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been it's been a really special season of my life that I'll definitely remember mm -hmm. um, forever. So, yeah, yeah. And those moments with Chistoff, like in those theological debates, <laughs> because for some of us, a theological debate sounds really, really full of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds terrifying to some of us. Some of us will fully embrace it, but some of us will not. Um, and we'll go into it very, with a lot of trepidation. So mm. do you ever find yourself in those moments thinking like, oh, my goodness, what am I doing? I don't have the answers. Like, Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Chisoff believes um, some things that I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and so in asking him about his beliefs and, you know, where he's at, um, I've really had to like, I think it's always wise to not always assume we're right um, mm -hmm. and really listen to people that we are talking to. Yeah. And so I've had to sometimes take things back and be like, hey, Joseph, um, I've like never heard that perspective before. And so I'm going to like read my Bible and um, I'll get back to you when I like see you next or like the next day yeah. even. Um, and I think that that ironically has – made him trust me more um, yeah. because I don't pretend to always know the scripture that's super point pointed um, yeah. answer to his question. Um, and I think that that should be an encouragement for everyone is one, God will speak through you in some moments where you like will not know what to say. And then all of a sudden you'll be speaking. You'll be like, what just happened? <laughs> um, and then two, like they don't expect you to have all the answers. And if anything, um, it communicates that you have a more humble posture and that you're not arrogant and that it's a conversation. Because mm -hmm. if you just came in being like, I everything I think is right and everything you think is wrong, like that's not a dialogue. Right. Um, and so my faith has been even more strengthened by listening to just stuff and really listening, being like, does that make sense? Do I believe that? Mm -hmm. okay, actually, no, um, and here's why. Yeah. Um, but I'm not just assuming that he's wrong. Right. Um, he's very smart and thinks through things in a really unique way, and um, I've grown from just from being his friend. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That. How has it been to, like, balance, like, when you spend so much time, like, over the last year of your life, like, mm -hmm. you spent over four weeks of that time. Um, like when you're home here in the States, do you find yourself thinking like, why? Like, this is so different. Like mm -hmm. life here is just so different than it is there. Is it difficult for you? Like, do you find yourself questioning, like, should I be there? Should I be here? Tell me more about that. Yeah. I think that it's definitely hard to come back into the luxuries of materialism and not feel guilty um, for what I have. Um, a lot of the orphans that I'm close to um, or even just other refugees follow me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And 
I have to think through, you know, every time I post something that they're going to see this. Yeah. Um, is, is this um, necessary? Um, and um, – but also balancing that I'm not God and I'm not the one that's going to save them. Yeah. And I'm not in control of stopping the war, although I wish I could. Yeah. Um, and so it's been a lot of give and take of I come back here and been way more quick to um, want to serve people that um, look nothing like me or interact with the Ukrainians that we've gotten to bring to the States. Yeah. Um, but also trusting that I can't be there for them all the time. Like I'm not omnipresent, only the yeah. Lord is. And so every time I go back, I try to remind um, my close people mm -hmm. of that truth that like when I'm not here, yeah. God is with you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And even when you are there. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Really good. Tell me what's, com what has community looked like for you? Like I'm assuming as you've like adjusted to life this has been like a year mm, like mm -hmm. you've yeah. been out of college for a year and a half yes a year okay and a half. Yeah. that's like such a small amount of time <laughs> and I have to remind myself of that yes um what does it look like for you to build community because you need it as you're like traveling across the world and working with people that you don't know and you're still planted here in Fort Worth so what does it look like yeah I have had the privilege of really getting connected to both the Christ Chapel, like Renovate Community, but also like the wider network of just believer young adults in the DFW Metroplex. Mm -hmm. And um, two ways I feel like that that's really manifested in the last year are through uh, my roommates. Mm -hmm. And I currently live with four girls that went to TC with me that are all strong believers and some go to Paradox, some go to Christ Chapel. And um, we, although we like all go to different churches, um, are all, you know, rooted in the same firm foundation mm -hmm. and getting to live with them has just been such an encouragement to me. Um, like they have been the people, you know, that support me and are praying for me um, as I'm overseas and then greet me when I get back. But then also we've gotten to bring that like same spirit of hospitality um, into our own backyard. And so kind of crazy story, but um, we started this thing called Sunday Hang. Um, and it sounds so cool. <laughs> it really was just the Lord turning us having our friends over into something to make much of him, which, mm -hmm. you know, sounds par for the course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so essentially we back last spring just had a couple people um, over on a few Sundays in the afternoon. We used to live across from a park. And so mm -hmm. we just gradually started becoming um, the people that would host because of that. And then um, we um, lost a friend um, last spring. Yeah. And um, in his passing, I think we're just really reminded of the importance of community. Mm -hmm. And um, he was just such um, an includer and intentional connector of people. Like he always went out of his way, even when he didn't feel like it, to um, make everyone feel really known. Yeah. And um, we wanted to just create a space where believer, non-believer, like anyone who needed a place to feel welcome could come and eat dinner and hang out with friends. Um, and so we started this thing where we just had people over to our house and and made dinner um, every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Um, if you want the address, you can <laughs> direct message me on Instagram. Um, but um, it's it's been such a joy to get to to host people and um, be a, a safe spot that people know they can come to every week where mm -hmm. they're going to be included. Yeah. So, yeah. And it is like, I've heard from people who are not you that like, it mm -hmm. is 
like it's a balm to mm-hmm. a lot of people, um, especially especially as people have grieved over the last year. Um, but also for people who don't know the Lord would never come to church, would not come to an event that was planned in a church. Exactly. But for them to come and experience like warmth and genuine care from mm-hmm. people who say this is from Jesus and they mean it mm-hmm. and they live it out. So I love that that's part of not only your story, but also like you guys wanting to honor Kimball in that way. And I think that's such a great um, testament to the Lord. Um, You've talked a lot about your roommates, and I'm so grateful that you guys get to have each other. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about what hospitality looks like? Because y'all are very different. Is Mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Okay. How does it work when you guys are hosting things or planning things? Yeah. It's so fun because— all five of our personalities are super unique. Mm-hmm. And I think that what's been really sweet about Sunday Hang is it kind of aligns all of our spiritual gifts and all the ways that the Lord has wired each of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it because uh, most of my coworkers would never walk in to you know, a Sunday service with me, but they feel comfortable coming to my house and I want to love and be a part of their lives. And so Sunday hang has been so fun because I can just like invite them. Um, But then some of our other roommates are so hospitable and love cooking and love hosting people. And Mm -hmm. um, one of my roommates is an interior designer. And so she loves like cultivating spaces for people. Mm. Um, And we just all – get to kind of bring out like the unique ways that the Lord has wired us. Um, And it's been really cool to see how um, all of those have complemented each other Mm -hmm. in just us opening up our home. So, And I think that's, I think a lot of us get tripped up in this idea of hospitality being like, you have to have a place setting and you have to do it right and you have to clean your house. And it's a lot of have to do's Mm. that um, we put on hospitality. But the way that you're describing it is very like, this is, it's just your life. Yeah. You invite people into your life and yeah, you can, you can cultivate it and make it beautiful and build on the beauty that God has already given you, but it doesn't have to be what you think it has to be. 100%. Some Sunday hangs look like we set this big table with like a tablecloth and it's beautiful and everything's Mm -hmm. put together. And some Sunday hang is we didn't have time to make dinner and we order um, pizza Mm -hmm. and the house is a mess and we still have people over and it's amazing either way. Um, And so I think that that's been a really cool experience to see God like he like just doesn't need us at all. Like we don't yeah. need to really do anything yeah. um, except show up um, and say yes. And so I think that that's been something that's challenged me because I would have, I think all of our roommates would say we would have never like committed to hosting people at our house every Sunday. Like that's yeah. a big commitment. That's a lot. Um, and that's why God in his grace like didn't have us start that way. We just mm-hmm. started by hosting people a couple times and then everyone, we just saw the need. Um, and it's been also so encouraging that um, I've seen other people in our community follow suit. Like Maggie and her roommates um, host people every Wednesday this summer when um, renovate leadership wasn't happening. Yeah. Um, and I've just seen a lot of other people step up in hosting and just offering up their homes, um, to be safe spaces for people. And, mm-hmm. um, it's been really cool and definitely transformed our community a lot. So yeah. mm-hmm. you, and I'm looking at it right now. I know listener, you can't see it, but, um, Lauren has a really, Lauren has a really beautiful story. Like there are a lot of things that she is the queen of showing up. Like she's the queen of the gospel. She's not the queen of the gospel, but like <laughs> absolutely she's, not. She's the queen of showing up, and I I think that's been very clear in what she said. Like she really shows up for people, and um, it's not. I'm not saying that to like puff her up or anything, um, but I think it's also because you have experienced that 
from other believers as well. And so I'm looking at your journal and I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if you would mind sharing about your roommate in your journal. Yeah. So I mentioned her a little bit earlier, but Catherine Gaddy, one of my sweet friends of many years, um, and now I get to live with her. Um, She gave me a journal at the beginning of this year. My birthday is January 4th. And so she gave it to me for my birthday um, long before we knew you know, what this year was going to have in store, all the good and the hard. And um, on the outside, it says, you are worthy of new beginnings. It's a Morgan Harper Nichols journal. Um, But on the inside, um, she prayed through, you know, what verses God should I, should I put in here to encourage Lauren this year? Um, And she wrote out Lamentations 3, 20 through 24, which say, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never end. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. And Catherine told me um, afterwards that when she wrote out these verses and the note that followed, um, she remembers being like, God, really? Like, these are the verses that... It's kind of a heavy thing to write in somebody's birthday journal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, it's basically a birthday card. And um, these are really, like, sad verses. Um, and she was like, you know, God, like, I trust you. Um, and I'm going to put these down. And she wrote out in her note below that, um, you know, that the author of Lamentation says some pretty dark things before these well-known verses. And he talks about, um, you know, almost losing hope in the Lord and yeah. and having no peace. And so she was like, I p- I'm praying that this year, like no matter the difficulties that you endure um, and any grief that comes, that you can remember to rejoice in Him. And I had actually um, had a journal I was using when she gave this to me. And so I put this um, in my desk drawer for safekeeping upon her, her giving it to me. And when I read it the first time, you know, I didn't think that much of it. Yeah. Um, and um, a couple months went by and I ran out of pages in my journal. And um, it was April 5th. Um, and it was four days after Kimball had passed away. And I pulled out, I needed a new journal because my pages had run out um, in my previous one. And I went through my drawer and um, pulled out this journal and read the note. And was just um, weeping, Mm -hmm. um, overwhelmed by how intentional God is um, to just have Catherine write these words so many months prior before we knew what was going to happen. And I was just so encouraged that our God is such a patient God that he would like give us a note way in advance and wait wait on it. Um, until he knew I was going to need it, but then also um, so personal that he would um, take the time to have Catherine write out something that was going to encourage me and then all of us. Like I remember grabbing Catherine right as I read this and reading it out loud to her um, and all of our roommates. And I just think that we forget that God is um, that present and yeah. that caring, even in the small things. Yeah. Um, like it's not anything monumental. She just wrote some verses down, but to me in that moment, they, they meant a lot. So absolutely. Yeah. And after a year of seeing some really, really hard and dark and difficult things, not just in your own life, but being part of the lives of people who experience such tragedy and upheaval and uncertainty for you to be filled with the hope of the gospel constantly mm-hmm. and to have that reminder from him like so sweetly. Um, I can't imagine that it wouldn't just fuel you even more as you continue to work with people across the globe and continue those relationships that you've already built mm-hmm. that God has blessed you with. So I'm really grateful. Catherine, I don't know you yet. You're probably next on the podcast list, but um, I'm really grateful that she wrote those words to Lauren so that she could encourage us with them. Um, in a minute, I'm going to close our time with prayer, but um, is there anything else, like any other scripture that really 
just encourages you or um, helps to motivate you when you're feeling overwhelmed with um, with the weight of what you're carrying sometimes or even just something that you feel compelled to share with women. Hmm. I think in this last season of my life, as you said, like I've been navigating personal grief, but also just witnessing the mass grief and casualties from the war um, in such close proximity. And so I think that the Beatitudes have been um, a passage I've just cling, clung to a lot in this past season of, you know, even when you feel like at your lowest point, um, the Lord says, like, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Yeah. Um, and um, blessed are those who seek justice. Um, and so although those in those moments when you feel like justice isn't being served or you feel um, overwhelmed with grief, um, remember that there's going to be a day when, you know, the Lord wipes away every tear and um he is going to bless and redeem all of those broken pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's been something that has brought me a lot of hope in this season. So Lauren, thank you so much for sharing so much of your life. Um, We will absolutely find a way to connect you with um, listener. If you're listening and you want to connect with Lauren, we would love to do that. So we'll get that information to you in the show notes. And um, I'm going to pray and I'm going to thank God for the good work that he does. Awesome. Lord, you are so faithful. Um, You love us so intentionally and you pursue us um, even when we run far away from you, Lord. Um, I'm so grateful that you have drawn Lauren to you and given her a passion for sharing your gospel with anyone and everyone. And I pray that you would continue to motivate her and us to share the goodness and the hope that your kingdom is coming, that you are a just God and a patient God and the God specifically who loves us, each one of us so deeply, that you would send your son to die for us and ransom us from this world of sin. Lord, would that be the thing that we share first and foremost with an attitude of humility? I praise you for the work that you've done in Lauren's life um, and for the words that you've given us today. And I ask humbly that we would carry your truth out today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. For more episodes, be sure to follow Encouraged and Equipped.